Well, if you've been with us the last several weeks, you know we had been in a series uh, that kicked off a few weeks after Easter called Empowered, all about the person, work, and presence of the Holy Spirit. We paused that last week to give a message and honor our graduates. And so we're going to pick back up this week and sort of wrap up the series. Um, and, and we touched on this a little bit two weeks ago in a message entitled Holy Spirit, Wind, and Fire. But what we I felt led to do was to come back and, and I have some particular things that I'd like us to focus in on on the, on the fire piece. Um, and it may not be exactly what you would expect. Uh, you might conjure up particular images when you think of Holy Spirit fire. And uh, things can certainly look like that. Um, but I think the Lord has some other things that he wants to particularly highlight to us today. So just by way of review, real quick, one of the things that we said at the beginning of this series, um, as we celebrated Pentecost um, here just a few weeks ago, Pentecost is the beginning of God's Spirit changing us and our circumstances. This is part of what we've been exploring through this series. And, and even though you know, Pentecost is a point on the calendar that we celebrate, a sort of a church holiday. It also is an important event when the Holy Spirit came in great power um, on those early disciples. But, but it was also, uh, in the same way that it was an event, or if you remember, we illustrated sort of those dots along the line of our life. Like that was a, a definitive dot, a moment, an event. It was also the beginning of a process of the Holy Spirit sort of brooding over the church. And, and remember, by the church, we mean all, all believers. So we like to say the big C church. So now we're not just talking about us here locally, but the Holy Spirit beginning that process of changing us. And, and that's part of what we're going to explore today. If you also remember uh, from two weeks ago, we talked about sort of these definitions of wind and fire and when we talked about fire, we said one of the things that it does is that it, it purifies. So you think of the process of like goldsmithing. You know, we have a, a young uh, apprentice in the back there who would probably speak to this in much more technical terms than I can. Um, but part of that process, at least in my limited understanding, is, is using heat or fire to uh, heat the materials up, and what happens in that process is the impurities, the imperfections, different things rise to the top, and they're able to be skimmed off. Well, this is where I think the Lord wants us to focus to conclude this series when we think about being empowered by the Holy Spirit, is that we might most naturally think of Holy Spirit fire as, as uh, you know, exuberant worship or, or like a, a mass healing event or, you know, something that has a really positive connotation. And I'm not saying that those things are, are not works of the Holy Spirit. What I'm saying is sometimes the process of the Holy Spirit coming in fire is that he actually wants to change us. He actually wants to get to those things in our life that are tripping us up, that are, are causing us problems. And he actually wants to purify us meaning that as we continue to pursue the kingdom of God, as we continue to encounter the Holy Spirit, we want to become more like him. He is perfect. He is holy. Holy means to be set apart, and the Lord is entirely holy. In other words, he's entirely set apart. There's no one like him, um, and yet we're made in his image, and we're called by, and we can only do this by his Holy Spirit, we're called to a journey of becoming more like him. If Jesus is the standard, that's what I'm moving towards. And sometimes when the Holy Spirit comes, and we'll, we'll try to give you uh, some more things to kind of grab a hold of. I know this might be a little abstract here starting out. Is that when the Holy Spirit comes with his fire, in the same way that that natural fire is not always comfortable, sometimes this transformation process has times of being uncomfortable. Yeah. But it's for a purpose. The Lord wants us to be more like him. He wants to get the things out of our life that are, that are tripping us up. Let's go, if you would, with me. I want to read a few verses 
out of Ephesians to kind of take us uh, towards where we're going this morning. So if you have a Bible or a Bible device, you can follow along. We'll have these on the screen as well. I'm in Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to start in verse 11. It says, Now these are the gifts Christ gave the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Excuse me. Their responsibility, which this will not be a surprise to you because I tell you this all the time, is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. So in other words, you could summarize our, our entire leadership's job is to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. That's kind of a fancy biblical phrase, but I don't know why I always feel like kind of camping on this, but I'm only going to be here a second. It's one of the reasons we as a vineyard like to say everybody gets to play. We don't want to be a community where those that are in positions of leadership or on staff are like the holy people. We're actually all the holy people, meaning that we all carry the same spirit of God. We all are empowered, as we've been exploring through this series, to share the good news of the gospel, to which can simply be sharing your story. But I, I just I, I can't stop from saying it's not just the job of your leaders. It takes all of us. It takes all of us to do the work of ministry. All right, let's go on to verse 13. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Okay, there's that, that picture again. Christ is the standard. Jesus is, is the model and we're moving towards that, and our work in that regard is not done until we've fully completed. We've fully measured up. Now, how many of you know that's probably not going to happen on this side of heaven, right? Like that, that work is probably not within our power to complete, but the, 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 the pitfall that the enemy is, well, you know, it's easy to write it off. Well, I, I can't become perfect like Jesus, so why try? Well, if you're just talking about your own efforts and gritting your teeth to have better behaviors, I might be with you. I've not had real good success just forcing myself to more strictly follow a moral code. Where I have seen is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Part of what grace means is not just that I don't get the penalty for sin. In other words, where I've broken my relationship with God and gone outside of his design, which is how I would kind of loosely describe sin. Grace, which you know that's what saves us, actually gives me the ability by the Holy Spirit to, to not be enslaved to that, not be enslaved to those things that, those things that pull on us, those emotional, you know, I mean, I, I know this is probably a, a tired example, but you know, when that person cuts you off in traffic and that emotion rises up, why you, you know, right, 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 what? Right. I, now, I, I mean, I'm, I'm using gibberish language because I don't know how colorful your language is, but it might not all be appropriate to be shared from the stage. <laughs> but when that rises up, like that, that, that's, we might think, well, that's natural. Well, we are emotional beings, and so it's not unnatural to have feelings, but what I'm saying is, some people have taken the Christian life and saying the way to address those things is to just train yourself to catch it and stop. And like I said, kind of grit your... I love you. You know, it's like, I really want to say you dirty, rotten, scandal, dot, 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 dot. But what the Holy Spirit does is he actually begins to change us so that the emotional response is changed. So that... I don't actually have that feeling of anger rise up. And, and, and what I'm saying is it's, it's going to the root. This is what the fire of the Holy Spirit... Uh, what, now, this is a progressive work. I, I'm not suggesting that any of you uh, who are followers of Jesus uh, have not experienced this at all, nor have any of you probably fully attained. I'm with you in that boat. We're in this... This in between. But what I'm trying to paint a picture of is that it's possible to probably be closer to that picture than we realize. 
it's possible by the grace and power of the Holy Spirit to be so transformed that those natural emotions are actually shifted. And this is one of the ways that the Lord actually, I'm going to use another sort of big word, but I'll help define it. We talk about the sovereignty of the Lord. And a lot of people like to say, you know, well, God's in control of everything. Yes and no. He has ultimate ability. He is over all. There is none higher than him, and there is only one God. He is totally and completely set apart. He created everything that is simply by speaking. Like, there, there's, there's no equal. There's no rival. Now I'm quoting song lyrics, but... <laughs> While that is true, he also delegates some level of his authority to us. And sometimes we get it wrong. Sometimes we get it messed up. And therefore, and because of the opposition of the enemy, evil and demonic influences in the world, evil exists. So, so what I'm trying to say is, God is in control, but he's not a micromanager. So in other words, we can't say... Uh, that because thus and so negative thing happened to me, well, God, God did that. I, I've given you this before, a simple, simple litmus test. If it looks like killing, stealing, destroying, death, disease, destruction, I mean, you can make the list as long as you want. If it looks like those things, or those things are the fruit of it, God is not the author of it. He says, I come to give you life, life more abundantly. So if things look like life, health, peace, all of these things, then, then that... But, but we live in this battle between those two things, right? There are spiritual forces battling things out, and we're, and we're caught in the middle. We're caught in the middle. Well, one of the things that the Holy Spirit wants to do in our life is to give us more and more ability to walk closer and closer to Jesus, to, to have that reality of Him being so near... That when we start to take a step, see, here, let me pause and, and back up. Let's go back to our example of being cut off in traffic. A progressive growth in this area might look like my natural tendency is to roll down the window and flip the bird and run off a whole trail of ex expli expletives. Yeah. That might be my initial natural tendency. Well, progressive growth in that area might look like you know, as I'm growing, as I'm asking the Lord for more compassion for those people who are also his image bearers, maybe I don't roll the window down, but I still grumble. I still have a root of anger. And, and what I'm saying is, the more we invite the Holy Spirit to come and transform us, he walks close with us. We like to say, like, he's an arm's length away. Like, he doesn't, he doesn't need to be far away from you. Well, if he's an arm's length away and I'm living in that reality, I don't, in my natural tendency where I might do all of the negative behaviors, it might take me hours, days, weeks to realize, you know, once I kind of come down from the, maybe I shouldn't have done that. I might feel sorry. I might feel convicted. Right? That's probably not how a Christian should behave. Well, what I'm saying is this, this empowerment of the Holy Spirit, if we recognize that he's right there with us, we don't have to go that far off the road and stay in the ditch to realize this progressive process that he has us in is uh, in that moment, I reach for the window and all of a sudden I feel this little... Pro and it's not just stop and grit your teeth and don't do that. It's like if we're paying attention, it might be, those are my children too. Like there might be some thought that runs across your mind that actually shifts your perspective and you begin to see things the way God sees. Well, this is that, that process, is, is living a life empowered by the Holy Spirit is recognizing he's always there. Now listen, he's not going to get, like when you do fly off the handle or, or exhibit X behavior, it's not like suddenly he's turned his back and he's not present with you. But we're probably not paying attention when we go off into those things. So we need to just become, I, th this, this is the point of this, some of this is just like thrown in extra, it's, we're off script again, but that's okay. Some of what the Holy Spirit wants to do is just help us to recognize that he is 
present, not just in like a moment where we ha- just had in, in our service where we come together, but he's present in those everyday things, in the mundane. And, and he wants, see, he, he can't actually become more present in a way. Because if he, if he lives in my heart, and if he's present, you know, literally less than an arm's length away from me, we can't become more present. But what can shift? My awareness of him. My awareness that the king and his kingdom has actually come near to me and desires for me to recognize that reality. Okay, we're going to leave the rest of that and, and move on. Let's jump back to where we were going, Ephesians. We're going to jump to uh, verse 14. Well, that's where we were. So we just read this section. Uh, We'll be mature in the Lord, measuring up. Verse 14, then we will no longer be immature like children. Isn't that how we act sometimes in that example? Uh, Like a a little child throwing a, a tantrum? We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. We could probably camp on that for a while, but we're not going to today. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. This is where I felt the Lord taking us today. Because especially, and we're not going to focus on it, but especially in our cultural moment, in our, in our American political climate, this phrase, speak the truth in love, gets tossed around a lot. Well, if you've been around here very long, you know I like to say that uh, you can't slap your brother if you don't love him first. You can't correct your friend if you don't have the relational equity to be able to speak into their life. So a lot of times we say, speak the truth in love, and what we mean is, I'm trying to correct you from a place of judgment. I'm assuming a place of moral superiority, and, and, and I'm trying to correct you without any semblance of recognizing the God's image-bearing nature of that person and the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. Even though that may not be the most evident thing to you, You will never meet a person anywhere in this world that God is not at work in trying to do something. Now, they're going to have all different levels of response and awareness. They may not have any clue, but you, as a a person of the Spirit of God, should know and should be looking, Lord, how are you working in this person? Despite what behaviors they might be exhibiting, how are you working in this person? And And I think that the charge to us, and you might be thinking, where in the world is this going connected to fire? My my point this morning is, and where I want to try to take us to wrap this up, is that we need, in complete uh, obedience, trust, submission, and vulnerability, to welcome the fire of the Holy Spirit to transform us so that we can speak the truth in love. Now, you notice I, I, I'm sort of pushing back on our cultural tendency to, to, you know, go around correcting people. But what I'm not saying is that we don't speak the truth. What I'm saying is we get it out of order. We need to get into love. We need to build relational equity with people. And then we will have a platform or an ability to speak the truth. So this is what we mean when we tell you uh, frequently. It's not our job to go around and correct everybody that's saying something wrong in the world. It's our job to love them. Now, we need to stand for truth. We need to speak truth. But what I'm saying is, in a relational context, you need to have the relational equity to be able to speak into somebody's life, to be able to offer correction in a way that doesn't push them away. Now, sometimes it's hard. I mean, I, I don't ignore that. Like, it, it, it's hard. But if you've built trust, if you've built uh, that relational equity, you can offer that, and it will come across as love. I think that's our, our charge this morning. 
But one of the things that we have to recognize, and this is where I think there's an invitation to us this morning, is that that process for us personally, each one of us, of being transformed by the fire of the Holy Spirit is going to be uncomfortable. It's going to require us to let go of some things that we might be holding on to pretty tightly. But it is a needed process. I was in a vineyard meeting in 2013, and, I, and some of you may have heard me tell a little bit of this before. Uh, it was my first national pastor's meeting. And uh, it was a phenomenal meeting. It was in Anaheim, California. And Steve Nicholson, who actually, uh, well, he's retired now, although just like our pastor, Ben, he's working more retired than he did when he wasn't retired. Uh, he's traveling all over England and doing different things. But, but he planted a church in Evanston, north of Chicago. And he uh, facilitated the ministry time. And he said this phrase that at the time utterly perplexed me to the point that I, I went and found him after and stood and waited to talk to him because it's like, I gotta ask, this makes no sense to me. I've got to ask him about this. And what he said was, and he almost said it off the cuff, but you know, sometimes certain things catch your attention. Because it seemed, and he, he said very confidently, the Lord wants to do something to you before he does something through you. And I thought, what in the world is he talking about? I, I'm, I've already been saved. I, I've already, you know, uh, accepted Jesus. I've been even filled with the Holy Spirit. I've, you know, I've been doing all the things that we're supposed to do. What more could God want to do to me and why does that sometimes precede him doing more through me? Well, I didn't really get much of an answer from Steve because he happened to be really busy. And, um, but he just sort of, you know, gave me a couple things to read and kind of, you know, like, here's some homework, and I, and I think God will, God will explain it to you. Well, what I've been on a journey of discovering, it really started before then, but that was one of those mile posts, is that if Jesus wants to use us, his people, his children, to change the world, he needs to change us first. He needs to make us look more like him. Because here's the truth of this whole idea of process and encounter. The power of the Holy Spirit that wants to empower you with all of the gifts and all of the abilities that you need to complete your mission will crush you if you don't have the character to carry it. The blessing of God can become a curse if we've not, in private, allowed Him to begin to transform our hearts and make us look more like Him and make sure that our motives are, are lined up correctly. Make sure that we're, now I'm not asking for perfection, but that we're making meaningful progress towards Christ-likeness. In other words, living our life that hopefully is moving in that direction of being more and more like Jesus. But we need that process in order. Now, don't get this twisted and think that you have to go through some uh, super long process before God can use you for anything. But what I'm saying is if you're, if you're sensing, God, I really wish you were doing more in my life. I wish you would, you know, I, I, I believe in this healing stuff, but I don't know that I've ever seen someone uh, healed as a result of me putting my hand and praying in Jesus' name. Maybe you identify with that. Well, that's what I'm talking about. If you're wondering, well, God, would you use me to do that? Would you use me to, you know, give me a thought of something that might be encouraging to a person that I can share with them? If you're wondering those kinds of things, it might be that God still has some things he wants. Now, he, I have no doubt, don't get any uh, doubt about his desire. He wants to to empower and use all of us to do those things. And we talked a while back about how his gifts are very situational. They're all available to us in the moment as he desires and as, as he wills and needs. But sometimes he wants to form our character in a way that we can support and carry the weight of responsibility that comes with being empowered by his spirit. And I know that's not like, a, well, we're all going to go out of here, you know, 
it's kind of hard. It's kind of uncomfortable. But I, I, I just felt as we prayed and, and read and prepared that we couldn't leave this series. And, and I believe for us as a church community, we are on a journey of more fully experiencing the kingdom of God and the king who is over that kingdom. I think that's being reflected in our worship, in our prayer, in our community life. I, I couldn't be more excited about the things that I see the Lord shaping and molding and doing, but we have to recognize in that process we also are going to have to do uncomfortable things if we want to look more like Jesus, if we want to do the things that Jesus did. Pentecost was the beginning. We're still on that journey. We've not arrived. But I think today, God not only wants us to speak the truth in love, but he actually wants to love people through us. This is why he wants to... He, see, I'm going to throw this into. I think when God looks at you, he doesn't see you in your present state. Because if you can imagine this with me, God sort of operates, it's kind of hard for us to understand, but I think God operates outside of the confines of sort of space and time as we experience it. And so when God looks at you, he can actually see you sort of in a future state where you've already realized the potential, where you've gone further in the journey than you currently are. And what he's doing, it, it, now it's not this linear, but if you just go here with me for a minute to help illustrate this, you know, if, I, if I'm at this point in my life, I'm 38 years old and this is the summer of 23, you know, God can see me somewhere down the line and he's saying, come this way, like, I see your potential. I know what you can accomplish. And sometimes he says and does things in my life that make no sense. I'm not equipped to do that. I'm not wired to do that. I'm not able to do that. And he says, in my eyes, you are. Because I know where I'm taking you. I know what I'm doing in your life. And you don't have a clue. This is paraphrasing J uh, Jeremiah 29. You don't have a clue how good the plans I have for you are. You don't have a clue how much I want to prosper you and give you that abundant life. You don't even have a clue yet. And we might be celebrating something and thinking, God, just as we sang together, oh, you're so good. And he is. But yet we don't even realize how good he is. At our moments of most celebrating and most realizing, we've only scratched the surface. There is always more. And God sees you as individuals in that way. Further down. So if you find yourself today longing for that, God, you know, all of this sounds good, but I don't know if I'm experiencing it. I don't know if I'm accessing the things that I think you've called me to. I don't know if you're doing through me what I think you want to. Call out to him. Ask him to move you. Ask him to meet you, to encounter you. Because just as I told you a few weeks ago, sometimes in his sovereignty, his, his ability to meet you in a moment can accomplish more by his Holy Spirit than years of process. And so I think this morning we simply want to invite the Holy Spirit to come and transform us. Now, the last thing that I want to say as we think about this is one of the most, for some of us, it might be easier for others, for some of us, one of the most uncomfortable things is brokenness before the Lord. It takes a lot of vulnerability. I encourage you, He can be trusted. But it's still hard to go there. It's hard to be to, to feel broken before the Lord. But but the good news is, and sometimes He actually takes us there. Sometimes this process of the Holy Spirit fire purifying our life will actually bring us to a point of, oh God, I love you. I love you, just like we talked about in worship. And then it sometimes can take us to the next step. Oh, but I haven't left you like I think I do. I haven't related to you maybe in the way that I should. 
There might, be a, a, there might come up in you an awareness, which again, to use church language, we would call conviction. And it's not about like convicting you of a crime. It's saying there becomes an awareness. Those impurities rise to the top. Oh, I haven't operated as in close proximity to you as maybe I thought I was. Maybe I'm, I'm not as close. But here, here's the thing. We can do one of two things when that happens. We can move into condemnation or we can lay our brokenness open bare before the Lord and allow him to come in and heal and touch and begin to put us back together. So as scary as it is to be broken before the Lord, to recognize, oh God, I have messed this up. I thought I loved you and now I'm realizing how little I've actually done to show it. In that process, he... he is wanting to rush in. As soon as you open up, he wants to rush in. Now, that's a process too. I'm not saying he's always going to put everything to right in an instant moment. He can. He does sometimes. It depends on situations, and, and he knows that. <laughs> His discernment is better than mine. Hopefully, that's not a shocking statement to you. It's probably the same is true for you. So why don't you stand... Um, and I'm going to pray. If worship team wants to go ahead and come up, um, we're going to do a final song here in just a minute. But I just want to begin even now to just invite the Holy Spirit to come. And, you know, this is one of, can I, can I just be honest and vulnerable with you? Like, I know when I entitle a message, Holy Spirit Fire, there's probably a whole array of expectations, assumptions, maybe baggage. Maybe you hear that phrase and you're like, oh, now he's talking about that Pentecostal stuff and I'm not quite so sure. You know, uh, your your response or reaction to that could be all over. Well, I I just want to say to you, I don't need to see any particular response from you. I'm not seeking to create uh, holy chaos, although the Holy Spirit has permission to do whatever he wants. But I'm not trying to craft and contrive something. Uh, I think sometimes in the American church we get tripped up and think, oh, if somebody cried, the Holy Spirit must have moved. Well, if you've known me very long, I I can be a a crier. Like when the Holy Spirit, I, I don't know, it just Somehow that's how my emotions come out. But we can't use that as a barometer either. Sometimes he meets us in very quiet and subtle ways. Sometimes he meets us in ways that we would rather him not. So my encouragement to you is just to be open and vulnerable to however the Holy Spirit is meeting you, to invite him. And whatever he brings to mind, lay it bare before him because I can't implore you enough. Just like that, I'm picturing that pot, uh, pot of gold. I guess it's a pot. I don't know how what you guys melt gold in. But when those impurities rise to the surface, in other words, anything that gets brought up, it's because the Lord wants to do something about it. It's not to embarrass you. It's not to condemn you. So if the thing that gets, well, you know, I'm just way too embarrassed about this thing in my life to ask somebody to pray for me. And you don't have to share anything more than you want to with anybody. But my encouragement to you is don't push it back down. The Lord wants to actually take it away. He wants to actually deal with it. He wants to skim those things off the surface and make you look more like him. We're going to sing this song, and I invite you even now to just begin. You can sing along if you want, or you can just quietly receive. But I want us to sing this song together as a prayer, and then we're going to conclude by praying for each other.